wanted to share that the woman in the middle um, was my great grandmother. Um, the woman um, to the left was my great great grandmother, and the woman to the right was my great aunt. Um, all women from the Opaxiat Cree Nation. So I, I think in reference to these women that came before me a lot, considering um, everything that they went through. So I could be here today. Um, my next slide was a photograph of my late uh, Musham Murray McKenzie. Um, he passed in 2007, but he was a photojournalist. So I like to think that um, we have a connection through that. Um, through that. So my grandfather, Murray, um, was a survivor of the Clearwater Lake Sanatorium. So he survived tuberculosis. And while he was in the sanatorium, um, he was one of the very few boys that survived. And we've learned now about the abuses that he suffered while he was there. But he was also gifted a camera by his sister. Um, who um, came with that doll, and she's a, a, a prominent Métis leader here um, in Manitoba. Um, but Murray was gifted a camera when he was a little boy, and that sparked his interest in storytelling. So I'd always had this fascination with my grandfather that I would see every summer, and um, the photographs that he would take, and the career that he had all over the world doing exhibits, taking portraits of Indigenous people just as they are. <laughs> Um, not to preserve anything, but just to showcase who we are as Indigenous people.
Vancouver, so-called Vancouver, on Musqueam, Tsleil-Waututh, and Squamish territory. There are a number of organizations. There's one called Fostering Change. Um, and in BC, there are delegated Aboriginal agencies. So they're given delegated authority from the province, um, although they're still governed by the province, like a parent would govern a child to oversee um, their child welfare practices. Um, so delegated Aboriginal agencies, I'm certain there are child welfare agencies um, in the States that would be similar. Um, and yeah, fostering change. So there's like advocacy groups um, that work with youth in infant care, um, as well as the services um, uh, that are provided to them. So in Vancouver, we work with youth from the Vancouver um, Aboriginal Child and Family Services Society. Um, and there was one more, but that's, yeah, that's what we did. We put out um, just like a letter and just like, we just all came together and covered it essentially. So to do that engagement and paid the youth for their time. Like the youth were all paid for their time to just come together and, and to share their knowledge. So, yeah. Anybody else? Yeah. Uh, what are your thoughts on Jordan Principle? Do you support Jordan Principle? Oh, that's a really, really good question. Um, so Jordan Principle um, is a principle in, <laughs> in, uh, just go ahead. in Canada, um, uh, just for our, our friends across the border. Um, there was a, a little boy named Jordan River Anderson, Norway House Cree Nation who passed never having lived in his home community. He lived and died in the hospital while the federal and provincial government were both fighting about who would fight for his home care. Who would pay for it? Who would, oh, so yeah, who would pay for it? Um, so he was red taped and he passed. Out came Jordan's principal, um, which is a promise, a commitment to fund um, youth for indigenous children. So is it working? I've heard no. I've heard lots of people have a lot of delays um, on accessing Jordan's principle. Personally, I've applied for it twice for my daughter. Once for um, financial support to bring her back to Kaskwiak so she could be on her homeland for the first time and the second for some dental work and they were really responsive to me. But I'm also like, I just don't really know her answer. Mm -hmm. But that should, I shouldn't have to fight for that. So um, I don't, I think that there needs to be more awareness and I think that um, there needs to be more support for people to access it. So, yeah. Another question. So this is the tricky part of the SOI, is that 
bring awareness to what's going on, and you're totally right. Around the same time that that one article um, came out about monies going to foster parents, um, another article came out saying that the child welfare system in BC is a super highway to homelessness. That was the that was the headline, and it's true. Like, um, I would have done a different headline. That wasn't a total I didn't think of, but it's hard hitting, right? Like we think about our children that grow up in the child welfare system and what they have to go through. Of course that is going to be the outcome. So what do we have to do to insulate our children so that we don't we don't perpetuate this cycle over and over and over again? Um, and so I have to have hope, and that's why Bill C-92, the ability for nations to draft their own laws, I think is so important. I know in Manitoba and Alberta, there hasn't been a lot of political will from the provinces to support nations in doing so, because what makes Bill C-92 special um, is that it gives indigenous communities in Canada federal supremacy over pr the provinces. So the provinces don't like that. Um, so there have been instances where um, provinces won't even sit at the table to discuss child welfare laws, but they don't know. Um, I did a year at U of X in the joint um, indigenous law and common law program. I'll go back one day, but not anytime soon because math is really difficult. But I do understand um, that Indigenous legal orders, from what I understand, is a collective of everybody coming together from the community to share your stories, your family stories, the stories that you've inherited, your lived experience, and then all those stories overlap together and you draw the legal principles and then you have your framework for your child welfare plan. It's easier said than done, but it's, it's starting now. It's a slow moving process, um, but it's happening do have that authority um, to do so right now, but it takes capacity and it's going to take time. Um, there have been a number of nations that have uh, made their, like, declared their own child welfare. The um, Keel in the Okanagan had their own child welfare laws. They also had their own water laws. Um, so they pulled together Bill C-92, UNDRIP, and the BC provincial statute, DRIPA, to put together this framework to reclaim our laws. So it's it's really braiding together like all these different policies and laws and it's really complicated and it shouldn't be. Um, the bottom line is that our, our Indigenous rights are being preserved sooner than ever. Any other questions? I don't think there's any more. Wonderful. Thank you so much for staying. I have no idea what time it is. <laughs> I thought it was going to be a 60 minute presentation but it was supposed to be 90 so you're free. <laughs> you want to go have some time before next session or for the luncheon. Thank you um, for carrying the story. Please carry it in a good way. And um, I'll have some cards up here if anybody wants to be in touch for as we move forward with the pilot um, or just to, just to be in touch with me. And I believe Eden brought the Decolonize the Media t-shirt. We have so many. So please, um, if you want to come up and get one of our Decolonize the Media t-shirts, we have a ton. So thank you, everybody. Really cool.